Hare Krishna. Welcome to the Bhagavad Gita class series. Uh, we are on chapter 7 and we will continue with our discussion on chapter 7. Before we start, we will recite the Mangalacharan prayers. I will share my screen and we will go through the Mangalacharan prayers. This is our Veda base website, Bhagavad Gita as it is, introduction, and we will go through the Mangala Acharan prayers. Mangala Acharan means for auspiciousness, for Mangala. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruve Namaha. Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Sthapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Hyam Dadati Swa Padantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Scha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamscha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nitinamine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine he Krishna Karuna Sindhu, Deen Bandhu Jagatpate, Gopesha, Gopika Kanta, Radha Kanta, Namostute, Tapta Kanchana, Gaurangi, Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari, Vrishabhanu Sute Devi, Pranamami, Hari Priye, Vanchakal Patarubhyascha, Kripa Sindhu Bhya Evacha, Patitanam, Pavani Bhyo, Vaishnave Bhyo, Namo Namaha. Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vas Adi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai Okay, so we are deep into chapter seven and lord krishna began chapter seven by describing the importance of understanding uh, this knowledge which is whole and complete this is complete knowledge about who is krishna and in a uh, loving and a non-envious friendly and a faithful way um so and this is not easy to understand when one's ego is uh, in front and center of oneself. One must really look at Krishna as somebody who is describing this knowledge, which is far beyond our uh, sphere of knowledge, our understanding. And this is uh, something gigantic, something far beyond what we are used to understanding and we should accept this knowledge coming from krishna then only we can appreciate it other we will find we will find all kinds of problems with this knowledge problems as in which will make us think that this is not true or this is just you know you can say anything you want so somebody has written bhagavad gita and they are saying whatever they want so it can be treated as just uh, some arbitrary words. So uh, that is the risk that one runs of understanding Bhagavad Gita uh, with a judgmental eye. At the same time, uh, it is not the same as blind faith uh, that Lord Krishna is asking for. Lord Krishna is saying, listen to it with, a, uh, with faith or and, and try it out. And that's why he calls this knowledge as Jnana and Vigyana. Jnana means the knowledge, but Vigyana means what you realize out of it through your own practice. 
so you take this knowledge you apply it this knowledge is highly applicative and you will get the results that is vigyan in mathematics there are no experiments because it's all theory so to say science so to say physics chemistry all there are experiments there is theory and there is lab so you can try out what you have learned in the theory and it comes out to be correct then you believe the theory so this this knowledge is more like which has a theory as well as a practical component it's not just theory again mathematics is definitely you know provable and there are ways to prove it and to understand it so i don't want to kind of say mathematics is unreal but in a general sense in school you don't have a mathematics laboratory in that sense i wanted to say whereas there is a physics laboratory chemistry laboratory biology laboratory where you can try things out so in that sense it makes it practical you have to do things with your hands not just with your mind so in that sense um and this can only be you know uh, then lord krishna went on which is what we spent most of our last week lecture on as to who is krishna and he starts by describing he is everything everything means that he is uh everything that is material and that is spiritual is coming from krishna so material elements he divided into eight categories and then the spiritual element so nine elements he described and he said he is the source or the origin of all these nine elements everything is coming from he is the origin everything is coming from krishna so that is where we left off in uh, verse number 7.6 let me share the screen okay so now we will start from 7.7 and 7.7 is an extremely beautiful verse and it is a continuation of a specific section going from 7.7 to 7.12 so what is this section basically going to cover this section is going to cover that krishna is the essence of everything what does it mean by he is the essence of everything that without krishna nothing will be able to persist or be what it is now when i say persist it doesn't mean that it will it can stay on its own for some time but quickly it will fall down or it will disintegrate that's not the meaning it won't even exist so that's why i said or be what it is so without krishna matter or even soul cannot exist nothing can exist without krishna he is the sustainer he is the uh life so to say now there is no life in matter but he is the life giving entity to everything he is what he is who gives everything its existence so i will come to that in in little more uh, we'll cover that in little more detail but this is who krishna is who krishna really is and another thing is that we will discover through our reading of these verses one second is that however hard we may try we cannot see when i say see it doesn't just mean seeing through the eyes or we can say perceive krishna through our senses or we can say through our material senses we cannot 
Krishna is beyond our material senses, completely beyond our material senses. This is a very, very important point. So, what this means is that searching for Krishna has to be done in a different way. So, that will lead to the next question, which will be a topic of discussion from 7.13 to 7.14. Then, how can one see Krishna? See or perceive, whatever is the spelling of perceive, or feel or detect Krishna. How? So that is the next section we will go to in 7.13 and 7.14. But right now we will see who is Krishna. So we already started our discussion of who is Krishna. He is those nine elements. So please remember last week's discussion Krishna is nine elements, eight material elements. Within those eight, five are gross material, which we can see and detect with our senses. And three uh, subtle elements, which are still material, man, buddhi, ahankar, which cannot be detected by empirical means, by our senses, but they are still material. And then there's the spiritual element. And now Krishna will go deeper into who Krishna is. Who is he? So we will see that. So this is the essence, but we will go very, very deep into this discussion. Who is Krishna? So let us uh, move forward. 7.7. 7.7 is an extremely, extremely important and beautiful verse. It has a lot of meaning hidden inside this verse. And uh, let us unpack 7.7. So 7.7 goes like this. Mattaha parataram na anyat kinchid asti dhananjaya mai sarvam idam protam sutre manigana iva. So the first two lines are together. A and B have a together meaning mattaha. Parataram na anyat kinchit asti dhananjaya. So what it means is, mattaha means beyond me or greater than me. Parataram, mattaha parataram, so beyond or mattaha means me. Parataram means beyond or greater than or superior. Srila Prabhupada says superior. Parataram. So again, you know. Uh, para, taram, and tamam. So, para, taram. Na, anyat. There is nothing. Na, anya. Anya means other. So, this word has been used several times. Na, anyat. There is no other. Kinchit, asti. Anything else. Kinchit, if you look at the word kinchit, it has been used many, many times in Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam, etc. Kinchit means anything, something, any even... One example, one little thing. But what Krishna is saying, na anyat kinchit asti. There is nothing else. Na anyat. Absolutely nothing kinchit asti. There is. So there is a complete negation of everything that is superior parataram to mattaha, which means Krishna is at the top of the hierarchy. There is absolutely nothing. So Many points can be made, which I will make uh, about this. Kinchit Asti Dhananjaya. Dhananjaya is Arjun. So let us focus on that. So there is nothing else superior to Krishna. And I will write it here in absolutely. Absolutely nothing else superior to Krishna. Because Krishna is saying, Na anyat kinchit asti. Kinchit means anything. It's the superset of all sets. So what this means is that Krishna is at the top of the hierarchy. Everything is coming from Krishna. 
in 10.8 verse which is a very important verse of bhagavad gita krishna says that uh, what is that how can i forget abhavam aham sarvasya prabhavo everything comes from me so same thing mattah parataram na anyat kinchit asti so which means that this defeats this statement defeats all arguments that krishna himself has a source that brahman is the source of krishna some people say or some say that some other person whether it be mother durga or lord shiva or whoever else are the source of krishna or somebody may even say our own imagination is the source of krishna krishna is a figment of human imagination or somebody may say that krishna is just a uh, you know source of somebody's writings he does not even exist so all these possibilities are you know discussed or or thrown out but here krishna is saying there is absolutely nothing else superior to me not matter not spirit so everything is inferior to krishna so that is point number 1 then uh in the second line 7.7a and b then 7.7c and d what is krishna saying mai sarvam idam protam that protam word here means everything rests on me or is strung on me i am the sustainer i am the supporter everything is sitting on me so to say i am using different words so mai sarvam sarva means everything mai means on me sarvam idam protam protam means sitting or resting or is supported by me on me sutre mani gana iva mani gana mani gana means a sequence of manis mani means uh, whatever jewels or pearls or whatever how are they a, a sequence of pearls held together by a string by a sutra so the important thing here to notice is that so i will just draw a string uh, a sort of a necklace like this and within this is running a string okay so yeah some child is showing a necklace so what is happening what is meant here is that first of all this string is the one that is keeping the necklace together if the string is not there the necklace will no longer be a necklace it will disintegrate into whatever else not necklace now this is just an example don't say that oh if the string is not there then at least the pearls will be there individually that's not the point look at the analogy everything 100% if you stretch the analogy too far it ceases to be an analogy so the analogy is that of a necklace mani gana not a single mani but mani gana and what is keeping it together is the string so the necklace will not be a necklace if the string is absent it is the one that is holding it together it is the one that is giving it the shape the strength so the shape strength everything is coming from the <coughs> string and the second important point to notice here is that the string is not visible to the eye the string is not visible to the eye that is another thing that is implied here so you can look at this necklace and you can think how is this necklace holding together is it that somebody has put some glue 
in between each bead or each pearl. That is how it is. How is it that it is held together? Or maybe there is, these are all magnetic. All of them. So if you put them together, they just stick together. Or maybe there is some, you know, unknown fairy which is holding them, each of them together. You can come up with all kinds of, no, this is real. I am talking of a very, very deep scientific thought here. You can come up with many, many explanations of how this necklace is held together. But what the eyes can see is that the necklace is being held together. That's all it can see. And our minds, our imagination can make up many, many um, explanations of why and how it is held together. Okay. Just like that story of the elephant, you might have heard five blind people touching various parts of the elephant. And they, somebody thinks it's a pillar. Somebody thinks who touches the ears thinks it's a fan. Somebody who touches the tail thinks it's a rope. So we can come up with our own imaginations based on our experience. Now they are blind. So their experience is through their touching, through their hands, which means they cannot see inside or they cannot see the elephant in reality in the same way we cannot see inside the pearls. So we can come up with all kinds of explanations. Another very, very common explanation that is given is that of a watch. Now I have an Apple watch. This can have a face of a dial or a digital. But in earlier days, you had a purely mechanical watch with a spring. You had to wind it every morning. All the people of the senior people here can say that those kind of watches existed. Then there are quartz watches, which run on a battery. And those quartz watches could also have a hand. So externally looking, the watch has a hand. You can have two explanations. It works with a spring or it works with a battery. How do you know what is inside? Now, yes, some smart person can say, oh, the quartz one will go like jerks. The second hand goes like in a jerky way, whereas the spring one goes in a smooth way. Fine. What if there is no second hand? Only minutes and hour hand. So analogies are supposed to be taken only as analogies. So don't, don't make these kind of arguments which, which uh, are beyond the analogy scope. The scope of the analogy, analogy is only that. So by looking at such a watch, you cannot know what is inside. And there could be many other ones like this Apple watch. It has software in it, which can make it look like hands or digital or whatever else you want. So it has a chip, a microprocessor. Of course, it has a quartz crystal and a battery also, but that's not the point. It's a whole different category by itself. It has a microprocessor. It runs code. It runs instructions, software on it, which makes it look whatever you want. Okay. So by looking at it externally, it is typically very hard to say what is inside. And what, what, what is the, the meaning here that is being described is that the only way to understand or to know the reality of what is actually inside is to ask the maker. If you go to Apple, go to whatever the engineer, he will tell you what's inside. Go to the whatever Casio watch with a crystal or a you know spring, he will tell you what is inside. Or you can go to an expert who can open the watch and he can tell you what is inside. But if you keep looking from outside, there is no way, no way for you to know what is actually inside. And this is the bridge between science and I can use many other words, philosophy, now, philosophy is all about speculation or the ways or categories of speculation. And uh, it's more than that. I'm, I'm sort of butchering the definition of philosophy. But 
at least I can say that science, so, so let me say this. There is something known as empiricism. Empiricism means whatever you can learn about looking, uh, ab about something by looking. That is empiricism. So that's why empirical ed evidence is very, very uh, strong, so to say, because if I look at it, I can know what it is. But, oh my God, empirical evidence can only tell you to the extent that you can look. So in this case, looking at the necklace, the empirical evidence just tells you that the pearls are next to each other forming a necklace. Now you are wondering the next question, how they are together. What is the real answer? And that is known as realism. Realism means that quest. It is the quest to find out the reality. Not a possible explanation that, okay, I know of one way how it can be done like this. No, that is not realism. That is empiricism. Realism means I actually want to know how it is being held together. The real stuff that is inside. And science always stays in the domain of empiricism. And what science does, and we are kind of going into a science heavy class, but this whole topic is science heavy because who is Krishna? Krishna is the absolute reality. Krishna is everything. And which is the branch of knowledge which tries to find out the nature of reality? It is science. So therefore, from our understanding, it's very natural to connect our scientific knowledge to this knowledge of who is Krishna, because they are both, the aim is one. The goal is one, and we are familiar with one path. So it is very easy to describe the other path. If you know how to go from Portland to New York, and you know how to go by, by um, driving, let us say, you know that over the, across the way, you will uh, you know, encounter Salt Lake City and Denver, and I don't know what else, and then you will reach New York. There can be an alternate route, but I can explain you, yeah, don't go to Denver, go to little bit north of Denver, go here. I can explain it in terms of what you already know because they are both taking you along the same direction. The goal is the same. So that is why this is a science heavy discussion. And it is very nicely understood when we talk about in terms of science. So who is Krishna? Krishna is the one that is holding the necklace together, but from our empirical senses. So empirical or empiricism means from our senses or evidence observed from our senses. That is empiricism. Whatever results or conclusions that we get from evidence observed from our senses and the conclusions that we can make from that is empiricism. It may or may not tell you what is real, what is really inside, what is making it happen, what is making the clock tick. So this is really the domain of science. And science says that as long as I can give you a possible explanation I tell you that here is the necklace and it has all been joined by glue. Each pearl has been joined by glue. So let's say science says that. So it is a possible explanation and you can make useful 
predictions from it. You can make useful predictions from it. Then what else do you need? Why do you care what is really inside? As long as all your observations, all your experiences can be satisfied by this possible explanation, then that possible explanation is equal to truth. You come up with a scenario where a prediction fails. Then we will reject this possible explanation and we will come up with a new explanation, which has to satisfy all the previous observations and the one that failed. Do you see what I'm saying? So that, at that point, a scientific theory can be rejected. But till a scientific theory can make useful predictions and no, uh, what should I say? Uh, no observations are falsified or what should I say, Gopal, help me here. Uh, observe, no observations are... Um, um, I also can't think of the term. No observations are uh, misaligned, let us say, with the theory. Holds good. Or, yeah. So... Or refuted or something. Refuted by the theory, then the theory is good enough, then the theory is equal to the truth. Why do you care? What is the real truth? Bhagavad Gita or the science of God tells us what is the real truth. So that is the quest. So the question is, if you are interested in the actual in the actual or real uh, cause versus a plausible or I would say a, a possible explanation that um, satisfies all observed phenomena. The question is, which one are you interested in? This is the domain of science and this is the domain of Bhagavad Gita. Okay. So, can we? You said we can't see through a string, but even though the scientific way might not always be true, um, isn't it true sometimes that parallel lines don't ever connect? That's true. So, not everything in the scientific domain is wrong. No, I am not saying science is wrong at all. So I didn't fully understand your question. You said about parallel lines not meeting and science is, uh, you know, um, true and all those things. So those are very correct points, very true points. So what's your question? Is science real or not real? Say that again. Are we supposed to believe in science or no? Aha, uh -huh. oh my God. That's a very deep question. Are we supposed to believe in science? That is the question. Okay, you can mute yourself. And the answer is yes. Absolutely yes. So maybe I wasn't clear. So let me explain again. Absolutely yes. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Science is real. Science is absolutely real. Let me explain the difference. 
of what I am saying. What I am trying to say is that science, if let us say, this is the domain of what is real, okay? Science can tell us everything till here. This is science. Okay. So all this is real. This is real and this is real. Because science tells us there are parts of reality that we can see. So these are, for example, the pearls in our example of the necklace. Pearls are real. Pearls make up the necklace and we can see the necklace with our eyes. And it is real. So you know that it is a necklace made of pearls. That part is real. This part we cannot see. For example, the string. Sutre mani gana iva. The sutra, the string we cannot see. But it is real. Is it real? Yes, it is real. So science absolutely tells us what is reality, but only to the extent that we can see or we can perceive through our empirical senses, through the senses using which we can measure stuff. We can detect the key words are detect and measure. And you can do a lot of useful things. So not everything has been made hidden by Krishna. Krishna has given us the whole beautiful world, as we will see in the next few verses. But what is keeping it together is Krishna and he is hidden. And the point is, he cannot be detected by our senses. So therefore, with science, we can go very far. Very, very far we can go. All of us have been through COVID and science has given us the COVID vaccine. It is useful. We cannot say that, you know, it's unreal. Science has given us so many things. Science has given us aeroplanes and, you know, the... My, my favorite uh, electronics device, this iPhone, I cannot live without it. And so many other things science has given us. But can science make you immortal? Maybe it can elongate your life more and more and more. Now, if you remove the abortion rates, which is a moral and ethical issue, so from the statistics, if you remove every baby that was killed in the womb by poor choices made by the mother, then life expectancy has gone up in the world. If you include abortion, life expectancy has gone down. That's because of the moral decline. But otherwise, science has caused people to live longer. So that's a great advance, so to say. Now, what people are doing with their long life is another matter. They are wasting their long life in uh, various useless activities. But that part science has not solved. But many things science has not solved. Just today I read there was a new article. Uh, I get weekly updates from Scientific American. And Scientific American is one of my primary sources of science, news and science knowledge. Very unbiased and so to say very measured and vetted source of science information and it said there are billionaires who are pooling money into a fund including Jeff Bezos on how to slow down aging because everybody wants to live longer and that's where many of the billionaires are spending the money not on world hunger not on making other people live longer, but how to make themselves live longer. Maybe they are spending their other some part of their money on those other things as well. So they are you know, doing both things. Anyway, the point is that science can take us 
very, very far into reality, but there are going to be portions of reality where science is completely clueless, completely clueless. And there is no even possibility that science can touch those areas in, in very, very long time in the future. And I will show you some examples. So the point is trying to see the reality is something that science claims is not my domain, is not my scope. I can give you a possible explanation which can help you to make useful predictions and use science. But what is the reality? Don't ask me. That's not my job, science will say. Just as a very small example, there was Newtonian mechanics. I'm sure everybody has re read the Newton's first law, second law, third law, and all those things, correct? Just by Newton's laws, just by Newton's laws of mechanics, man was able to go from earth to moon and come back. That whole, kindly mute yourself unless you have a question. That entire journey of man, which is considered to be a huge progress of mankind, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. That's what uh, Neil Armstrong said. That whole journey was completely based on Newtonian mechanics. Not one equation of special relativity or general relativity was used. Now, is Newtonian mechanics the 100% precise picture, does it give Newtonian mechanics, does it give 100% precise picture of reality? Hmm? Does it give? Anybody? Yes, no? No. 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 Okay. There were some predictions which were falsified, which were not aligned or could not be explained by Newtonian mechanics. There was a famous experiment done in 1919 or some time where, and this was about general relativity and this is the sun and this is Mercury. Mercury was behind the sun and here is the earth. Okay, and there was a lunar eclipse, uh, sorry, solar eclipse. This is the moon over here. So everything was perfectly aligned here. So there is the earth, here is the moon. I'm just trying to draw it in a way that it is in sort of scale, some kind of scale and Mercury was here behind. So the sun, the sun's, the whole glare of the sun, so to say, was shielded by the moon because of the solar eclipse you all might have seen solar eclipse. So the glare of the sun was shielded, okay? And Mercury was coming out, it was going out, it, it revolves around the sun, all planets go around the sun, right? So Mercury was here. And then when the sun's glare was not present, what the scientists saw, when Mercury was here, now I'm drawing an exaggerated diagram, okay? What they saw was that even by calculations when Mercury was behind the sun, they were able, let me kind of show it in a different color, red color. This is the line of sight or how the light traveled. The light from Mercury reached the earth. They could see Mercury. So which means if I am to draw sort of the sort of the line of sight, they could see Mercury. Okay, which means then they concluded that the mass of the sun was able to bend light. Now, for those who are, you know, not too much uh, into science and may not be understanding this, do not worry. But, uh, you know, we'll still discuss these things. And this whole bending was all of 43 seconds of an arc. 
this angle was so small, 43 seconds. In a circle, there are 360 degrees. You divide one degree into 60 minutes in an angle, not like a clock minutes, but in an angle. So you take one degree, maybe like this much, and you divide it into 60 parts. One minute, you divide into 60 seconds. That much small angle, and this angle was only 43 seconds difference. Very hard to detect, but with very precise instruments, they were able to detect. And this gave a proof that mass can bend light. Till then, the theory was light always travels in straight lines. And which further gave the uh, understanding that yes, the whole space is curved because of mass and so on and so forth. I won't go into all those details. But this theory then knocked out Newtonian mechanics. Newtonian mechanics is not true. It is only a one possible explanation to some level of crudeness, to some level of granularity. But the reality is general relativity, which could explain this 43 second difference. Newtonian mechanics cannot explain 43 second difference. But why do you care? One would ask, if I have to go from my home to my school, and here is my acceleration, and here is my speed, I can easily calculate how much time I will reach in. And I need only accuracy till the order of seconds. Why do I need to care about microseconds and milliseconds? But the question is, is it real? Is that the real explanation? Maybe not. It will still get you to school on time. But it is not the real explanation. So this is what I am trying to explain here, that science is only giving us explanations that may allow us to make useful predictions. The reality is Krishna. So let us move forward and I will, you know, I don't want to spend the whole sort of discussion on just science, but let me, let's move forward and, and I will explain some more things as we go along. So 7.8, now from 7.8 to 7.11, Krishna will give, I think, 14 examples. Let me see. Yes. 14 examples of Krishna's presence in the universe. Now, mind you, these are just examples. Krishna is present everywhere. But in all of these 14 examples, eh, Every single one of these examples, you will see the following. That Krishna is the essence that gives the core existence to what is being discussed. To that particular entity. Krishna is the essence and it is impossible, impossible to see that essence with our material senses. It is impossible to see Krishna with our material senses. That aspect of Krishna, which is the core existence of what is being discussed. So let's look at 7.8. You have a question, Saswita? If Krishna exists, why can't we never see him in real life? Yeah, we will answer that question. The question is, if Krishna exists, why can't we see him in real life? We absolutely can, but not with our material eyes. And how we can see him, I told you, we will talk about it in 7.13 and 
Remember, we talked about in a previous slide. Then how can one see, perceive, feel, or detect Krishna? If Krishna is invisible or not possible to see Krishna through our material senses, then how can we see him? That will be discussed in a later section. So please be patient till that point. Okay? 7.8 says, Raso aham apsu kaunteya Prabhasmi Shashi Surayoha Pranavaha Sarva Vedeshu Shabdha Khe Paurusham Rishu. So in 7.8, Lord Krishna is saying that he is five things, five entities. Number one, Raso Aham Apsu Kaunteya. So you can lower your hand, please. Rasa means juice or taste. Ras is juice, we say, right? Ras so, or juice or taste. Taste of water. Apsu means water. I am the taste of water. Raps, raso aham. Aham means me. So here you will see the word uh, aham or asmi so many times. So raso aham apsu, my dear Konteya, my dear Arjuna. I am the taste of water. Next, Prabha Asmi. Asmi again, I am Asmi. Shashi Surayo. I am the light. Prabha. Light of Shashi means moon. And Surayo means sun. So I am the taste of water. I am the light of the sun and the moon. Next, Pranavaha Sarva Vedeshu. Pranavaha means I am the essence, I am the Om of the Vedas. Then, Shabdaha Khe, I am the sound of Kha, which we had discussed in detail last week, Ether. Or, or space. And finally, Paurusham Nrishu means I am the ability or you can say manliness. Now this is not about man or woman. Manliness or ability. The, the life, Paurusham, life, manliness, ability in Nrishu means man. So Krishna is saying, I am these five things. Now, if you look at it on this side of the list, I have drawn a line. The right hand side is all you can see through your senses, can perceive through our senses. Our material senses, I will just put it that way. On the left-hand side, you cannot perceive through material senses. Can you? The left sound. side... Huh? Sound we can. Okay. We will talk about it. Sound of ether, by the way. Okay. And that way you can also perceive light. Okay. I will turn off the light here. You could perceive a change, isn't it? Now on, now off. So you can that, is, that, that is reflection. Yes, that is reflection. But I want to go a little deeper into that understanding. So let us say taste of water. The light of the sun and the moon. What is the meaning here? Now we can, you know, um, just argue that yes, I can not taste sweet and sour. Now, water is something empirical. Yes, if I give you water, you can say it is water. Now, again, connecting this to science, you can 
say that you can put water in some some instrument and it will see oh i see h2o molecules therefore it is water okay so you can say that it is water but can you have a measure of taste now you can say water is tasteless that's fine but can you have let's say i give you some juice some orange juice apple juice sweet can you make an instrument which can say this juice is sweeter it can obviously tell you maybe what is the uh, whatever is the component that makes it sweet uh, what is it that makes it sweet sugar whatever is the compound it can say yes there are more molecules of this or maybe the light is a better example it can say that the frequency of the waves that i am observing is so many hertz i don't know what is the frequency of blue light or yellow light what is the frequency of yellow light can you look up and tell me somebody and white light how many what is the frequency so my point is so somebody tell me please shout out one of frequency huh frequency of yellow light yes It's Uh, 5.16 like 5.16 10 to the 14th tell me just a approximate number 5 5.5 times 10 to the 14 10 to the 14 what uh hertz hertz and white light yes. or some other light i mean green blue light, light a blue blue light is 6.66 yeah 6.6 times 10 to the power 14 hertz right right okay great very good now all that empirically we can say is that i see a electromagnetic wave of 5 times 10 to the power 14 hertz or 6.6 times 10 to the power 14 hertz what has that to do with the blueness or the yellowness or the greenness of light there i assert there can be no instrument that can give it a color the color comes from krishna the color as we perceive it because we are also living entities we perceive that essence as krishna that krishna is that is that entity that is giving a frequency of 6.6 times 10 to the power 14 hertz electromagnetic wave the yellowness or the blueness of the color otherwise it's just a something that you measure materially you just measure something you measured something so that appreciation for what exactly it is is something only a living entity can perceive and that thing that gives that object the appreciative capacity is krishna krishna is giving the color to the light krishna is giving the taste the sense of taste inside any liquid that is what is being given by krishna krishna is that otherwise it's just some numbers empirically so it's not wrong but we can only go so far and say okay this is what it is but the appreciation of it cannot come when if krishna does not is not present inside it so like that i know it's a little hard concept to to understand but you know i hope some of you at least are getting a sense of what i am saying we will talk a little more about it next verse so okay i to told that we will talk about sound of ether now ether has the has a sound now space has no sound now sound doesn't mean mechanical sound waves sound means the vibrations within ether the vibrations within space now in science we can connect it to let's say the fabric of space time it's a fabric today's modern science understands that it is a fabric 
but what is giving it the nature of being a fabric why is it a fabric that is krishna i'll give you now now that we are on this topic let me share with you a a different aspect let me talk about something called gravity okay so again it's going to be a very science heavy class today m1 m2 what is the equation of gravitational attraction between gravitational force between them the force of gravity is what come on somebody g m m by r square yes g m1 m2 by r squared where r is the sort of the distance between their centers of mass correct and we can make a lot of progress with this equation this equation has helped us tremendously tremendously in science it has made man gone to the go to the moon come back it has given us all the satellites that are revolving gps weather satellites meteorology this that all these things wars spying spy satellites on other nations so that we can be safe thankfully that's one of the reasons why no nuclear bombs have been dropped from one country to another because each country is spying on the other through satellites all that is coming from this equation okay are you with me now there is a fundamental question what is the cause of gravity does anybody know the answer to this question what causes cause of we can say force of gravity what is the cause of that force due to the mass of the object that is a very so somebody said due to the mass of the object so i have a mass m1 here why is it exerting a force on m2 which is r distance away and r could be thousands and millions of kilometers why it would be a pull between the yeah you can say anything you want on the basis of your high school level physics knowledge or even phd in physics i am telling you that this question has not been answered nobody knows absolutely nobody knows what is the cause of the force of what causes what is the underlying cause you can say it is due to the mass so what what is the mass doing we just do not know now according to some of the latest theories and this is known as the theory of quantum gravity okay there is a particle called a graviton now i don't know much about it i am not a phd in physics i am a very interested student of physics but there is a particle called a graviton and what happens is that they say that when there are two masses m1 and m2 they are exchanging gravitons so gravitons are flowing between them and there is information that is flowing between the two masses or something like that and something happens whatever and the two particles become begin to come closer to each other because of a flow or an exchange of gravitons okay has anybody seen a graviton till today have no 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 Oh, we've seen a graviton no hmm the answer is no next question kindly mute yourself if you are not talking i know there is a lot of uh, enthusiasm and interest to talk but uh, raise your hand and you can speak up but stay on mute on at the other times 
So the previous question was, have we seen a graviton? The answer is no. Next question, will we ever see a graviton? Now, first of all, graviton is just a possible explanation, as I said. Nobody has seen it, but it is a possible explanation of how gravity really works. Science is trying to come as close to realism as possible, but it will not be able to call itself science unless you observe it through empirical means. So till today, it is just a possible explanation, but will we ever see it? Let me show you some... Uh, the graviton can be considered as an ultraviolet race? No, 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 no. Please. So, so here is a the, the Wikipedia article on a graviton. Very and Wikipedia, as you know, is fairly well written. It's not just some um, pseudoscience. And if it is, people will go and correct it. And here is what it says about the experimental observation of gravitons. Unambiguous detection of individual gravitons, though not prohibited by any fundamental law, is impossible with any physically reasonable detector. Is impossible. Science is saying we cannot detect it. The reason is the extremely low cross section of the interaction of gravitons with matter, whatever that means. For example, a detector with the mass of Jupiter. So first of all, you have to build a detector with the mass of Jupiter. There itself, it is impossible. 100% efficiency it needs to have placed in close orbit around a neutron star. Where the hell are you going to find a neutron star within your visibility, within your vicinity? Would only be able to expect to observe one graviton every 10 years even under the most favorable conditions. That is the possibility or probability of empirically detecting a graviton. So fundamentally, the point is that it is not possible. And this is not being said by me. It is being said by a scientist. Here is the paper, if you are interested in. I found out the paper. A scientific paper, Can Gravitons Be Detected? written by Tony Rothman of Princeton University. So no, some, some Joe Blow, uh, you know, person on the you know, road is not writing this. This is some scientist from Princeton University that is writing it. And I, I read the later part, the conclusion of this, of this thing. And it's, uh, you know, all the technical details are here, but it is just not possible to detect a graviton at all, no hope of detecting it. So you can understand when graviton, which is a particle, supposed particle, is so hard to detect, what to speak about Krishna? Gravit this graviton supposedly is giving the force of gravity. That is Krishna. Krishna is giving the the um, um, taste of water, the light of the sun and the moon. Now, how can else can you write it in Bhagavad Gita? And Bhagavad Gita cannot be written in terms of photons and gravitons. Okay? But this is the understanding that we need to take away. Let me give you one final example of something that was detected. And I will just share with you how hard has it been to detect something? So let's talk about something else. You must have all heard about this thing called a God particle, a very poor name, but this basically is some, someone's uh, imagination to hype up science and to show that science has discovered God. So this is all nonsense. It's not a God particle. Even the scientists say it's a very poor name. But what is the real name is a Higgs boson. 
Okay, a Higgs boson is nothing else but where is that? This is the standard model of elementary particles. This is all particle, uh, sorry, um, you know, particle physics and, uh, and uh, you know, all, all kind of stuff. And here you can see a Higgs boson over here. All these other particles have, uh, you know, had more established theories of, or had, had some experimental detection. The Higgs boson was the last one to be detected. It was detected in 2012 by the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. It's that big particle accelerator. Now, just to give you some sense of how hard it was to detect the Higgs boson. By the way, Higgs boson gets its name from the scientist, Peter Higgs. Here is a, a, a photo of Peter Higgs. Okay. And he had proposed, the proposal of the Higgs boson was done somewhere in 1960s. He had proposed maybe it exists like graviton. People are saying maybe it exists. For almost 52 years, there was a quest to actually detect it, to actually find the Higgs boson. Can we see it? It took 52 years and a lot of scientific and engineering advancement to build this LHC for greater than $10 billion. So that we can detect, of course, many other things were detected so that we can detect this thing called a Higgs boson. And finally, in 2012, they possibly detected it. And let me tell you a little bit story behind that also. What was detected was not the Higgs boson. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about Higgs boson. Here I went to this uh, um, website of CERN itself. This is the website of CERN. If you see the, the name of the URL is atlas.cern updates whatever Higgs boson shadow. Just to give you some idea here, yeah, look at this line. The Higgs boson decays fast. How fast? Do you know how fast? Now these particles decay, which means they cannot stay into existence for a very long time. So this particle decays not in one minute, not in one second, not even in one nanosecond, it decays in 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 22 seconds. Now, those who understand little bit of uh, numbers, 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 22 seconds. This is the time of existence of time of life of a Higgs boson. How do you detect it when it lives for such a tiny amount of time? You cannot detect it. They have not detected the Higgs boson. I'm not saying that they were lying. Please, science is correct. And there are very, very solid theories. But what I'm trying to tell you is that when you go one layer deeper, you can understand that actually when you say something was detected, what it actually means. So there is this, let's say this is the Higgs boson particle. And first of all, just like the graviton I showed you, it's not easily produced. It is produced after a trillions of tries. So fine, one Higgs boson was produced by luck. And in 10 to the power minus 22 seconds, or 1.6 times, it disappeared. Disappeared or it decayed half-life. Okay, so again, mathematicians don't, don't, don't call me out, but very soon it decayed. It decayed into some decayed particles. 
let's say this, 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 it decayed into three particles. I don't know how many. Some other particles, these are the remains. This is the dead body, you can say, dead body of a Higgs boson. This dead body is what was detected by the LHC. The decayed particles, and from that they did analysis and a whole bunch of calculations and very, very thorough calculations were done. But from this, they came up with a backward uh, assertion that a Higgs boson must have been there because we now see some after effects of it. This is what was detected. I'm just trying to tell you how hard, how absolutely hard it is to detect even trivial nature, let alone Krishna. That is my point. And that is what we need to appreciate. And that is what gives force. That is what gives life and meaning to the entire universe. If gravity were not to exist, we would all not be here. If light were not to exist, if photons were not to exist, if atoms were not to exist, none of us would be possible. Who is holding it all together is Krishna. Krishna is holding the universe together. That is what I want you to take home. And we cannot see him. And it is a futile question to, you must realize that, oh, if science cannot show me who, where is Krishna, I don't believe in Krishna. Science cannot show you graviton, but there is gravity. After $10 billion and 50 years of effort, it showed you Higgs boson, didn't even show you that. It showed you some effects of that. These are fundamental forces of nature. So saying that I will only believe it if you show me, you should not be believing in gravity. Go jump off a cliff with the belief that gravity does not exist. Then you are, I'm just trying, are you, I hope you are getting the point of what I'm trying to convey. Now, I just want to conclude this sort of whole discussion with one point that then why so much focus on empirical evidence? Why doesn't everybody just believe in Bhagavad Gita and say, okay, this is it. Why is there this so relentless focus on evidence? And the answer is because there are so, there is so much noise around what can be sort of the unknown. I can say, oh, you know, there are little fairies. Or I can say there is Krishna. The Muslim people can say, no, no, it's Allah. Christians can say, no, no, it is Jesus. And then we can all fight on it. No, Jesus is the cause of gravity. No, Krishna is the cause. No, Allah is the cause. And then people get so agitated. So the ahankar comes up and then you start killing each other. And then... So my point is that we as flawed humans take things to the extreme, take things given by God or things or I would say knowledge given by God to the extreme and apply our false ego to it and misuse or abuse 
that knowledge. We have this tendency, we have this flaw to abuse or misuse that knowledge. Also in the same Bhagavad Gita where Krishna says, I am everything, I am gravity, I am light or whatever it is. In the same Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says Ahimsa. So if we are true followers of Krishna, we have to follow everything. So this is the reason why science comes as a savior. Science is the savior. Science says, okay, you can say Allah, you can say Jesus, you can say Krishna, and I will only believe what I see. And unless everybody sees the same thing, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, this, that, 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 we will not believe in it. So if you do an experiment in science, I'm sure in CERN, there were Muslims, there were Christians, there were Hindus, they were all, they all agreed. Yes, we saw Higgs boson. We all saw electrons and atoms. If you do an experiment, if you look through an electron microscope, whether you are a Hindu, Muslim, you will see whatever molecules, atoms, whatever it is. Maybe you cannot see atoms, but whatever. So science is giving you a, a proof that you can see from your material senses and that's all you believe. And that removes conflicts. So if you see historically, science is simply a way of removing conflicts. We all can agree on a common understanding because we can see it, see it or perceive it or whatever it is. Detect it, measure it. And that is the benefit of science. It removes conflicts and of course it gives us useful tools. It gives us tools. An iPhone is a tool. A space rocket is a tool. A COVID vaccine is a tool. Is a tool to kill the virus. So science gives us tools which we can put to some use. Of course, we can misuse them. We can use the gun to kill somebody else, which is also given by science. Gunpowder is a scientific chemical. You ignite it, it immediately expands. That is gunpowder. And when it expands in a barrel of a gun, you can use it to shoot a bullet. So ultimately, guns are nothing but chemistry. The chemistry of gunpowder. So this is where science becomes very useful. But what we have done is that we have latched on to science and said everything else is bogus. So that is where we must try out our own experiment with experiencing Krishna. There is no need to force, let us say a Muslim or a Christian or somebody, no, you must experience Krishna. No, 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 no. If you have let them very faithfully try to experience Allah or Jesus or whoever they have faith in. If you have faith in Krishna, you do your own experiments to experience Krishna and you will experience Krishna. You will get to know that remaining part of reality, which science cannot tell. That is the purpose of Bhagavad Gita to complete the picture of reality because what science has given us is a partial picture of reality, which is very useful. No doubt it is useful, but it is not the complete picture. Just like Newtonian mechanics was not a complete picture of gravity. You needed general relativity to come in and so to say, complete the picture or at least make it more accurate, make it more precise. 
So similarly, when you add Krishna, the experiments that you do in Krishna consciousness, it completes your understanding of reality. And that is the ultimate knowledge. And that is why this chapter is called Knowledge of the Absolute. Jnana Vijnana Yoga. So, with all this long explanation, let us continue with 7.9. So, 7.9, Lord Krishna says, Punyo Gandha Prithivyam Cha Tejas Chashmi Vibhavaso Jivanam Sarvabhuteshu Tapa Cha Asmi Tapasvishu. So, here what is Krishna saying? Punyo Gandha Prithviyam. So, Prithivyam. Prithivya is the Prithvi, the earth. Gandha, I am the fragrance of the earth. Now, again, the, there is fragrance of the earth. We discussed this last week. But the quality of the fragrance, no instrument can measure. Only a living entity can appreciate that fragrance of the earth. You can say, yes, there is this chemical, there is this chemical, there is this chemical. You can talk about it in terms of atoms and chemicals. But the, the, ex, the appreciation of that fragrance can only be, uh, come from a living entity. Tejas cha asmi vibhavaso. So I am the heat of fire the heat that you get. Now, again, this is not the heat that you can detect with a thermometer. Thermometer will just tell you a reading, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees. But there is a temperature at which you feel comfortable and there is a temperature at, you feel, at which you feel miserable. That feeling of the heat, that is Krishna. Jivanam Sarva Bhuteshu. The life Within all living entities, Sarva Bhuteshu, the life is Krishna. You look at this body, what is it made of? It is made of carbon, it is made of water, it is made of sulfur, or whatever you know, elements are there that make up this body. What gives it life is Krishna. Science cannot detect life. Science can tell you exactly what is the composition of the body, but not what gives it life. Tapa cha asmi tapasvishu. I am the tapa of the tapasvi. 7.10. Bijam maam sarva bhutanam. So, I am the seed of all entities. Sarva bhutanam, which is, means I am the seed giving father. In 14th chapter also, Lord Krishna says, I am the seed giving father of all living entities. 14.4, I think he says this. 14.4 or 14. Mm, no, or maybe it is. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm mixing up the verse. Anyway, so Bijam Mam Sarvabhutanam Vidhi Partha Sanatanam. Just try to understand this eternal truth. Buddhir buddhi matam asmi. I am the buddhi of the buddhi matam. Buddhi matam means I am the in, of the intelligent people. I am the buddhi. I am the intelligence of the intelligent people. Tejas tejas vinam aham. I am the tej, the prowess of tejas vinam of powerful of powerful men, Tejasvinam Aham. So I am the Tej of the Tejasvinam. Now in 7.11, a very, very interesting point comes. Balam Balavatam Cha Aham Kama Raga Vivarjitam. I am the Bal of the Balavatam. I am the strength of the strong. Okay. But Kama Raga Vivarjitam, that strength which does not lead to kama and raga 
ಕಾಮರಾಗ ವಿವರ್ಜಿತಂ ವಿವರ್ಜಿತಂ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಡಿವೈಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೊ ದ ಸ್ಟ್ರೆಂಥ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಇಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಸೇಯಿಂಗ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ದ ಗುಡ್ ಕೈಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಸ್ಟ್ರೆಂತ್ ವಿಚ್ ಒನ್ ಕೆನ್ ಯೂಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಗುಡ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಓನ್ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಗ್ರಾಟಿಫಿಕೇಶನ್ ಬೈ ಸ್ಟ್ರೆಂಥ್ ಬೈ ಬಲ ಯು ಕೆನ್ ಡೂ ಲಾಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಗ್ರಾಟಿಫಿಕೇಶನ್ ಯು ಕೆನ್ ಒಪ್ರೆಸ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಸಪ್ರೆಸ್ ದೆಮ್ ಒಪ್ರೆಸ್ ದೆಮ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಎಂಜಾಯ್ ಎಟ್ ದೇರ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೆನ್ಸ್ that kind of strength krishna is saying i am not i am the strength which is used for beneficial purposes for everyone and the last one is very interesting krishna says dharma viruddho bhuteshu kamo asmi bharatarshabha kamo asmi here kam is referring to the sexual activity of reproduction but that kind of one which is dharma viruddho dharma aviruddho one which is not against dharma dharma aviruddho bhuteshu i am in all beings kama rag sorry kamo asmi bharatarshabha i am that kind of desire for sexual activity which is not against religious principles which means and religious principles say that this should be used this desire for this activity should be used for offsprings for producing offsprings not for sense gratification there may be sense gratification as a by product but that is not the purpose and definitely the purpose is not that out of the sense gratification if there is offspring you go kill it therefore the purpose becomes exclusively sense gratification at the cost of the offspring it should be the other way around the offspring is the main product the sense gratification could be the by product but one should not do it exclusively for that and eliminate the main product which is the offspring but that is what is happening today in the world so bhagavad gita is clearly saying dharma aviruddho bhuteshu kamo asmi bharatarshabha therefore shrila prabhupad says in this very small purport one of the smallest purports in bhagavad gita just three sentences Shri Prabhupada is saying the last line the responsibility of parents is then to make their offspring krishna conscious so therefore one should produce offspring there is no problem in producing offspring and for producing offspring you have to perform the activity but the purpose is not sense gratification but the purpose is to produce offspring that are krishna conscious so one must never forget the main purpose of the activity and get wound up in the sense gratification okay so that is 7.11 now 7.12 so 7.12 is a generalization or a you can say summary or you can say conclusion of this section what section that krishna is everything and everything in this universe comes or originates from krishna so one and two are related sentences said opposite ways and the third one is that not pos i'll just say this because there's very less space to write not possible to detect or see krishna with material senses 
I have just used some abbreviation there. Not Abhiji, cost 14 4. Sorry? 14.4. Ah, okay. Thank I am you. the seed. Ah, that, that and I was right then, 14.4. I didn't see it. Probably I'm not looking carefully. Yeah, so Krishna says in 14.4. Yeah. Aham bija pradha pita. I was looking at the beginning of the verse, but I was, yeah. Aham bija pradha pita. I am the seed giving father of all the yoni, sarva yoni shukanteya, of all the species. Anyway, thank you, Mataji, for finding it. So these are the three main points. And Krishna is going to summarize these in 12th verse. So see, let's see how he is summarizing this in the 12th verse, 7.12. So 7.12 is a very important or a conclusion of this section. Ye chaiva sattvika bhava rajasas tamasas chaye matta eveti tan vidhi natva aham te shute mai so, Lord Krishna is saying that, I'll read the translation, know that all the states of being, whatever states of being there are, goodness, passion, or ignorance. So, Lord Krishna says here, ye chaiva sattvika bhava rajasas tamasas chaye. So, three are being mentioned. The three uh, modes, the three root uh, modes, uh, sattvika, rajasa, and tamasa. Goodness, passion, and ignorance are manifested by my energy. So there is goodness, passion, and ignorance. These are manifested by my energy. So there is Krishna's energy. Isn't it? That is what it is saying, the verse. That all the states of being, be they of goodness, passion, or ignorance, are manifested by my energy. So Krishna's energy, and where does Krishna's energy come from? From Krishna. So from Krishna comes Krishna's energy. From Krishna's energy come goodness, passion, and ignorance. Now goodness, passion, and ignorance, for again, a little bit going into the direction of science, you can see that these are modes, but these are also the deepest fundamental elements of this universe. These are the deepest and most fundamental, most fundamental elements of the universe, not Neutrons, protons, electrons, photons, not even the standard model made of leptons, neutrinos, quarks, bosons, not even string theory, strings. No. All those things that I just mentioned, all these buzzwords, can only produce gross matter. Bhumir apa anala vayu kha. That's all it can produce. It cannot produce man buddhi ahankar. Goodness, passion, and ignorance, sattva, tamasa, and rajas, sattva, rajas, and tamas. These are the root elements which produce that matter. The five gross elements plus they produce man, buddhi, ahankar. So from these come the eight elements, so to say. Eight elements, which means five gross plus three subtle. But the root elements are goodness, passion, ignorance, which means that this is the, these three are the fundamental ingredients of the universe. The raw ingredients, as we say. What is the raw ingredients of like today we made rice in our home? What is the raw ingredient for pulao? Let us say biryani, pulao, whatever. What is the raw ingredient? Rice. Similarly, the raw ingredients, the fundamental ingredients of the universe are these three modes. And Krishna is saying he is the source of these. 
and then he says in one i am in one sense everything but i am independent so he's saying krishna is independent of these so in that way he is saying that by looking at goodness passion ignorance you cannot see krishna it this goodness passion ignorance is coming from krishna but by looking at this you cannot see krishna krishna is independent for they on the contrary are within me so everything is contained within krishna and krishna is within everything this is a concept we will deal with later in the ninth chapter but if you see here what we said krishna is everything since the three modes sattva rajas and tamas they are coming from krishna and these are the three fundamental raw ingredients of the whole universe it means krishna is everything or everything in this universe originates from krishna because everything originates from these three fundamental ingredients and these ingredients originate from krishna therefore everything originates from krishna but krishna is independent of these which means by looking at these three ingredients or anything that is made up of these ingredients you cannot find krishna so it is not possible to see krishna with material senses with material senses you can probably after lot of effort after spending billions of dollars after going near a neutron star after building an instrument as big as jupiter if you are able to do all those things maybe you can see the fundamental ingredients of goodness passion and ignorance as particles of some standard model or some advanced stuff but you will still not see krishna so then the next question becomes 7.13 then how to see krishna if i cannot see krishna so now we know who is krishna krishna is the source of the entire universe but he is so subtle he is hidden like a string of the necklace how can we see him and that question will be answered in 7.13 and 7.14 so how to see krishna so before we go into that let's see what questions are there so are there questions oh somebody had said gravitons very nice you can use an x ray okay well that was not the point can we say tangible and intangible again i am kind of a little lost in terms of uh, which point is this at which point of time somebody made this comment yeah so i don't see any questions as such on the on the chat are there any questions anybody has yeah there is somebody who has said krishna is brahma but incarnated as krishna this time around i don't understand what is meant by this time around but krishna is not not brahma, brahma and brahma. krishna is not brahman either okay go ahead yeah i thought that krishna basically since he is the god head he is the sup- supermost authority so he is brahman and when we talk of krishna as we see uh, at the time of bhagavad gita let us say then he is the incarnation of the same brahman as he has incarnated as rama as krishna as narasimha okay. and all those so things. so just to simplify the discussion thank you that's an important question just just to kind of keep it at a at a very simple level in some crude terms what is being said is that there is something called the brahman and from brahman 
comes Krishna. Okay? That's what you are saying. This time around and at some other time, Brahman transforms into Rama and various other avatars. But this is the sort of the when we are talking about Krishna here, we mean him, Brahman. Aha. Uh -huh. So this is the I'll I'll say it up, up front. This is the incorrect understanding. Okay. Good that and I, I will tell you what is the correct understanding. Okay, and I will justify it. I will prove it from the statements of Bhagavad Gita. Okay. So if you see here, just to kind of understand this little bit at a little bit deeper level, from Brahman comes Krishna. That is what is being said by, I'm not saying you, you are saying it. That's what many people say. And that is a, a misunderstanding that is out there in the minds of many people. Okay. What this means is that we will go into this definition of cause and effect. Okay. Can we say that what, what is being said is Brahman is the cause and Krishna is the effect? Isn't it? In any phenomenon, let me finish, please. Uh, and listen to me, just listen carefully. In any phenomenon, there is a cause and there is an effect. And the cause comes before the effect. Isn't it? The cause comes before the effect. If I ask, let us say, why are you late to the meeting? The effect is you are late. He will say, oh, the cause is because I kept sleeping. Isn't it? I overslept. That is the cause. So before, at some point in time, you overslept. And today you are late. Or now you are late. Isn't it? You understand the cause and effect? And cause comes before, effect comes later. Which means that Brahman is the cause or it was there before. Now we have Krishna. Do you see that? That's what is being said here in this statement. Correct? I will show you two statements from the Shastras, which completely refute this. Now, by the way, this verse 7.7 .7 that we have read today itself says this is we spent a considerable amount of time discussing this where krishna is saying mattaha parataram na anyat kinchit asti there is absolutely nothing which is superior to me now you will probably agree that the cause is superior and the effect is considered inferior because if you can address the root cause, then you can address the effect. If you eliminate the cause, the effect is also eliminated. But if you eliminate the effect, the cause may still remain. Isn't it? If you have some disease and you take Tylenol or painkiller, the effect is gone, pain is gone. But the cause is still there. The disease may be there. But if you eliminate the disease, the effect will also go. So the cause is considered to be the superior in philosophical discussion. If we are discussing pure at a purely philosophical level, the cause is superior, the effect is inferior. But here Krishna is saying that I am the most superior. Parataram na anyat dasti. If you look at that Sanskrit, there is nothing superior to him. So the most superior equal to Krishna. That is what is being said in 7.7. .7. So if the most superior is Krishna, how can anything be more superior to him? Then you are um, violating this verse. Can I say something? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I analyze it like this, that when Krishna at the time of Bhagavad Gita is speaking, which is let's say 5,000 years ago, mm -hmm. He is telling that he as a Krishna is actually the Brahman. He, he may be called Krishna. Where? Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. I will ask two questions. I'm okay. just having a philosoph a very deep discussion and I'm happy that you're bringing up these points. These are exactly the points that others also bring up. But you have an open mind and therefore I am open to or I am you know willing to go ahead and engage in this discussion. Thank you. Okay. We can say that what you are saying, but where is Krishna saying that? On the contrary, in chapter four, if you remember, Krishna said, I spoke the same Bhagavad Gita to the sun god. This is not the first time. So this whole argument that now Krishna has come as Krishna is also refuted by Krishna. And then finally, because time is running short, I will show you a very important verse, 14.27. This is the killer verse of this argument, this whole argument. And many, many Acharyas have used this verse of the Bhagavad Gita to defeat this argument that is being made. And here Lord Krishna says, Brahmano hi pratishtha aham. This Brahman, hi pratishtha aham. The Brahmano here is means Brahman. So this Brahman's pratishtha is Krishna. Pratishtha means foundation. So what comes first, the foundation or the house? Hmm? What comes first? Foundation. 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 Let me ask you in a different way. Can the foundation exist without the house? Hmm? Yes. yes. You, can. you might have seen many you know, places where only foundation is there. Maybe the contractor ran away. Yeah. Or, you know, the builder didn't get paid. So he laid the foundation and then he ran away. There is no house, only foundation, you see. Right? right. Let me ask you, can a house exist without a foundation? No, no, no. For a short time. Not possible, Not Not possible, possible. right? It will disintegrate. Yeah, it is for a short time only. Yeah. yeah, fine. Short time, whatever. But again, analogy. Oh. Here, Krishna is not using the word found, uh, house and all that house foundation he's just saying pratishtha pratishtha in sanskrit means the the cause that is the root meaning of the word mm -hmm. okay when you go into battle or when you go into anything you go with your pratishtha you enter into that situation because you know you have the pratishtha you have the ability so the ability comes first and then your entry into some battle comes later. The cause is this. So pratishtha, the root meaning is cause. So Krishna is directly saying here, Brahmano hi pratishtha aham. Directly he's saying, I am the foundation or I am the source. I am the cause of the pratishtha, of the Brahman. So that argument is defeated as far as Bhagavad Gita is concerned. And we said in the very beginning, our domain of discussion is Bhagavad Gita. Okay. Now, some saint or some very senior Acharya here, there may say anything. We should ask where, if it is written in Bhagavad Gita, please show us. Or any other Vaishnava Shastra. Let me show you one more Shastra. And we will, we will then conclude this discussion. And that Shastra is known as Brahma Samhita. The first verse of Brahma Samhita says, and this Brahma Samhita are prayers by Lord Brahmaji oh. to Lord Narayana okay. before he created the universe. So, and the, those prayers come later, but the Brahma Samhita is giving that whole situation, what happened to Brahmaji, etc. and all that. And right in the beginning, Brahma Samhita is giving this axiom. This is a axiom. And this is exactly the axiom which we discussed in the orientation class of Bhagavad Gita. Because if you do not agree to an axiom, everything else will not make sense or nothing else will make sense. So to understand Brahmaji's prayers as to Brahmaji, why is he even praying to Lord Narayana? So the fundamental, the first axiom, even the Euclid's, uh, geometry starts with the fundamental axioms because if you don't agree to that, the rest of the geometry will not make sense. And the axiom is Ishwaraha Paramaha Krishna, first line itself. The Param Ishwara, Ishwara means what? What is the real meaning of Ishwara? 
Ishwar means boss. Mm. Who is the boss? Paramaha, the supreme boss, not Brahman. Otherwise, it should have said Brahman or okay. Ishwaraha Paramaha Brahman. Brahman is the topmost. No, Ishwara Paramaha Krishna. Satchidananda Vigraha that we will discuss later. These are the qualities. These are the attributes of that Krishna. He is Satchit Ananda. Anadir Adir Govinda. Anadi means he has no beginning, no origin. You cannot say like this in this cause-effect relationship. Where is this? Okay. So we have Krishna. Okay. What caused Krishna? Because if we can answer this question, what is the cause of Krishna? It will become superior. Oh. Isn't it? Right. If Krishna is there, something must have been the cause. Let's find out who is the cause or what is the cause of Krishna. Let's find out. Because if we are able to find out, that becomes superior to Krishna. So let us go on the journey. But that line is saying, Anadir Adir Govinda. This Govinda or Krishna has no, is, is no beginning. There is nothing before him which you can say this is the cause. And finally, the last line says, Sarva Karana Karanam. He is the cause of all causes. Karana. There is no cause. So, this is the fundamental axiom. So, I have shown you all angles that Krishna is the cause of himself. He doesn't have any further cause. He is Ishwaraha Paramaha. He is the topmost. He is from 7.7 .7, we read Mattaha Parataram Na Anyat Kinchid Asti. There is nothing on top of me or superior to me. And he has also said Brahman is inferior to me. So this whole logic has been addressed perfectly from all the angles. There is no angle which you can say that is unaddressed. We have proved that X is greater than B. And we have also proved B is less than X. And we have proved B is not equal to X. There is no doubt here that X is greater than B. We have proved it from all angles. Okay. okay. This is the authority of the Shastra. So if you are to believe or we are to believe the Shastra, that is the understanding. Otherwise, we can believe whatever we want. People believe money is God. People believe time is God. People believe whatever XYZ is God. So people have their own gods. No problem. All right. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So these two classes were very science heavy. Now from next week, we will go into, so this was the Jnana part. So if you remember, we discussed about Jnana and Vijnana. In 7.2 verse, Lord Krishna says, you will get the full understanding of what is Jnana and Vijnana. And Jnana is the theoretical knowledge and Vijnana is the practical understanding. So now we have theoretical understanding. Oh my God, Krishna is this unimaginable entity or person or somebody who we have no hope of approaching. How will we even approach him? He's unapproachable. He is undetectable. But now comes the practical aspect of how we can approach him and what are the methods to approach him? What are the wrong ways of approaching him? So not only what are the right ways, what are the wrong ways? Okay? Like a GPS. A GPS tells you, a GPS device, as long as you are going on the right path, it will keep showing you the arrow, the whatever. The moment you take a wrong path, it will say wrong turn, recalculating. It will warn you. If a GPS 
just stops showing the arrow and lets you go on the wrong path, then it's not a good GPS, isn't it? It must tell you what is the right path and it must also tell you what is the wrong path so that you do go on the right path and by mistake, you do not go on the wrong path either. Both must be told, then you have the best chance of staying on the right path, isn't it? And like reach on, the destination. Like on roads, you say, huh? And reach, reach the destination. And reach the destination safe and sound in one piece. Yes. The Prabhuji, now the theory is uh, almost over and we are going to the practical. Yes, next week so we next will week. start the practical aspect. Oh, little must paper milega lab test ke liye. We will explain you the, the litmus test. <laughs> and I will continue to explain it in a scientific theme, but it will be in a very, very practical sense. Yes. Anything else? We are going lab next week. <laughs> yes, now theory class is over. We will see you next week in the lab. Thank you. Okay. All right. Very Thank interesting, you. Very interesting class, Prabhuji. Science heavy. And we talked about a God particle, which is a nuisance. Yeah, new. Even the scientists say that they are also not happy with this sort of overhype because yeah, it brings a bad ahead. name to them. They want to remain perfectly correct and precise. Science is all about precision. The moment they are hyped up to a level where they cannot justify, they don't like it because it's, they are afraid that people will begin to doubt science. Yes. So the best policy is to be very, very precise and accurate. No more, no less. So that always, whatever you do, ex whatever experiment or whatever measurement you do, it comes out to be right. The best thing that science can do for itself is to keep coming out correct all the time. Prabhuji, one thought coming to mind is what is good, whether spiritualism is good or religion is good? At a fundamental level, there is no difference between it. If you, feel, if the religion feel, is bona fide, please listen. If the religion is bona fide, now again, then the, it becomes a very big question. What is a bona fide religion? But if the religion is bona fide, is coming from God, is all I will say. Now then the, all kinds of questions can be asked. That is Krishna God? Is Allah God? Who is, is he the right God or the wrong God? Those are you know, all kinds of questions. We can have a debate all night and wars have been fought and uh, massacres have happened on that question. But the answer is that just between spirituality and religion, a bona fide religion, which means religion coming from God is no different than spirituality because the purpose of spirituality is to bring us closer to God or the spiritual element we can say spiritual element. Let me, some people love to eliminate God from the picture because this ahankar comes. Oh, why a superior person I have to submit to? I will submit to this spiritual entity, this abstract entity that is more palatable. But I don't want to submit to a superior person. Okay. So the, means, all those angles, but the, they are both the same at a fundamental level. Now, if we remove the fundamentalism from the religion, then it remains only the spirituality. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will Hare see Krishna. you all next week. Hare Krishna. In the lab. In the lab. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.